Today we'll be covering a ton in open source. I'm excited to get through things today and we got a lot to cover, so let's just jump straight into it. Framework Mono 6.14 is the first major release in Mono in five years, which is exciting to see some progress on this as Microsoft gave this up to Wine HQ in order for them to advance the framework. And it's also received a rebranding called Framework Mono instead of just Mono. For those of you that don't know, Framework Mono used to be an open source implementation of Microsoft's .NET framework that lets developers build and run .NET applications across platforms like Linux. Now it's being maintained by Wine developers and is completely open sourced. It's fantastic as this first release of Framework Mono from its new home, Wine HQ, includes work from the past five years that was never included in a stable release because no stable branch had ever been created at the time. Highlights are native support for ARM64 on Mac OS and many improvements to Windows Forms for X11. Fantastic as this is going to seemingly further our integration with Wine, giving Wine better capabilities of running Windows applications. So it makes a lot of sense why the people at Wine HQ took this development over and it's nice to see a pass down from Microsoft in this open source development. Can't wait to see what kind of cross-platform compatibilities we get with this framework. But right now what's new in 6.14 is again, that native support for Mac OS on ARM. We already talked about system Windows forms, improve support for generated COM interfaces, fix some common cases where processes would hang on exit, added Gregorian translations and some other bug fixes. I'll continue following the development as Framework Mono continues, but this is definitely exciting to see. Moving on to this week in Plasma, we're of course seeing new features, UI improvements, bug fixes, and performance optimizations. Notable new features in Plasma 6.4 include that you can now control whether a window has a title bar and frame from its task manager context menu. As you can tell here, the user has right clicked, hit more, and now they have access to this no title bar and frame. Some UI improvements in 6.3.3. The digital clock widget now shows a nicer looking font picker dialog. So a new and improved dialog for us. There also was an improvement on the way the screens are presented to remove any technical information in cases where it's not needed. So they're just cleaning things up. But the focus wasn't necessarily 6.4 this week. Instead, a ton of notable bug fixes in 6.3.3. For those of you using KDE Plasma, you'll be happy to hear that there have been stability improvements, including fixing of a crash K-Win issue on login or crashes after waking from sleep and even crashes while closing apps via the middle click on the task manager. They resolved the persistent black lock screen issue on X11 and improved keyboard responsiveness on the screen locker, addressed problems with the K-Runner text overflow, including visual glitches with the blurred plasma widgets and many more bug fixes, including performance improvements. If you want to check this out in more depth, I'm going to link this in the description below. So check it out there. Plasma never ceases to amaze as the KDE Plasma team is constantly working on bug fixes. This of course is a weekly occurrence. It's great to follow Nate here who gives us these updates. Right now I'm finding myself using KDE Plasma more than the rest of the desktops. Let me know what you're using in the comment section below. But speaking of desktops, GNOME 48, the release candidate, has been released, meaning we're very close to the final release of GNOME 48 coming to us in about a week's time. So we're at the end stages here, now available for testing. The final release candidate is encouraging testers to explore its new features and try to get things to break here. They have an entire list of updated modules and changes, and there's a lot of discussion going on back and forth. And for those of you who are interested in everything that's new in this version, we have a ton of new modules being updated, which are thoroughly explained. Again, I'll put a link in the description below so you can check this out for yourself. There's a lot to go through. Speaking on GNOME 48, Ubuntu, the Linux distro that ships by default with GNOME, is also receiving updates 25.04 Plucky Puffin Progress. There's a lot going on with this update as they all took a moment to reflect during the midpoint of the Ubuntu 25.04 cycle on challenges, including acknowledging the loss of their dear friend and colleague, Steve Langasek, who passed away earlier this year, which is very sad. My condolences to his family. Steve was a pillar of the Ubuntu and Debian community and a longtime member of the foundation's team, someone whose dedication, insight, and generous mentorship shaped the way we work and collaborate. And with that, there's a new beginning amidst a difficult start to 2025 we have a new VP of Ubuntu Engineering and they shared some of the ideas for the future of Ubuntu. I'm excited for how things are going to shape up. 
But with the milestones, basically we have an LTS update, Ubuntu 24.04.2 long-term support was released on February 20th after a slight delay due to HWE kernel issues or hardware enhancement. And finally, we have a feature freeze achieved on February 21st, making the freeze of Debian imports with only bug fixes allowed. We received some component updates as well, including updates to tool chains, things like glibc, systemd, openssl, all have received updates. But what's exciting is the what's new section. Every Ubuntu release, especially the interim ones, is an opportunity to bring new features and new experiences to our users. Here are some of the specific changes that are coming up with Plucky. Starting with DragCut, it is set to replace the NIT RAM FS tools as the default. And they've been hard at work making sure the DragCut could be used as an alternative. That's exciting to see. And a new crypto config tool introduced for system-wide cryptography. As this is the early days, they are definitely asking people to join in and give important feedback on how this new crypto config is working for them. The ARM64 desktop received updates as well, as the team remains committed to their goal to keep Ubuntu beginner friendly and accessible to everyone. With the rise of ARM64 processors, it makes sense why Ubuntu is focused on trying to get official builds of the distribution into the hands of people who use things like the Amper powered workstation or the Apple Silicon Mac. Anyways, exciting stuff to see the plucky puff in progress. And what else would be exciting is if you smash that like button for me and think about subscribing below. YouTube can get finicky and you wouldn't wanna miss another update video like this. Let's continue on to talking about the Rust Core Utilities. The announcement of a new release, Rust Core Utilities 0.30, which in this release enhances the capability of the GNU Core Utilities 9.6, reduced test failures, and is a broader effort to port more Unix tools to Rust for improved memory safety and community engagement. This was made possible by the dedication of 22 contributors and eight newcomers, which is quite a significant amount since the last release. Their efforts on this one was directed at adapting the new upstream version rather than fixing existing test failures. And what you can tell is how many failures have occurred and how close they are getting to passing versus the GNU C core utilities. We can see that they're slowly getting up there right about that 500 mark when you compare the C version at around 600. So we're getting closer and closer with every release. We still got a ways to go, of course, lots of coding to be done in Rust in order to catch up to the GNU C core utilities. They go into exactly what changed below. I'm not going to get into this, but I will post a link in the description below so you can check it out for yourself. Lots of new notable improvements, but there's more about Rust. As Redox OS, a Unix-like general purpose microkernel based operating system that is completely written in Rust, has a new exciting release. They first talk about Fostum 2025 and discussing which grants they've been awarded and how the continuation of the project will play out. But what I'm interested in is some of the new improvements here, including an improvement to the nano sleep system call to return the time remaining after software interrupt and improved consistency in memory page representations. This comes in pair with updates to kernel drivers, including various updates like the Intel HD audio support and PS2 touchpad support. Some other improvements include a fixed tree node leak on the file deletion. There's been scheme improvements, relibc improvements, terminal improvements, improvements to programs, how they build, and documentation. And since it's entirely written in Rust rather than C, it serves as a practical example of how modern, memory-safe language can be used to build a full-fledged operating system. It also is significant because introducing Rust into the Linux C-based kernel has become a challenge. As we all know from dramas in the past, there have definitely been some cultural issues including some prominent C maintainers voicing their opinions and concerns on mixing languages that might compromise the Linux kernel's long-term maintainability and coherence, which we're watching play out all live. But Redox OS is a completely Rust-based Unix operating system where developers, if they don't see Linux fit or don't want to program for Linux, they can definitely check out Redox OS. Moving on to a very interesting one, as Tails has announced replacing Valena Etcher with Rufus as an installer for Windows. This comes at a surprise as I've definitely used Belen Etcher in the past, so I want to read why. But where I first heard about this was from Switch to Linux called Warning, Etcher sends personal information to third parties. That definitely came as a surprise to me. And now emerging users to maybe think about switching 
over things as we're going to read here in Tales. Rufus is a great alternative. I've used that as my secondary flashing tool for a while, but let's read about what happened to Belena Etcher. We replaced Belena Etcher with Rufus in our installation instructions for Windows to solve privacy concerns with Belena Etcher. Since January 2019, we have been recommending Belena Etcher to install Tails from Windows and Mac OS. We love the simplicity of Belena Etcher, as I did myself, which was really easier to use and work well on Mac OS as well. Shortly after, Belena Etcher started displaying ads. Although we didn't like that, we initially didn't view it as a significant privacy risk and have no better alternative at the time. However, in 2024, the situation changed Belena Etcher started sharing the file name of the image and model of the USB stick with the Belena Etcher company and possibly with third parties. While we have not experienced or heard of any attacks against Tails users stemming from this change, we believe it introduced potential for abuse. To eliminate that risk altogether, we started looking again for alternatives. After evaluating seven other tools, we finally chose Rufus, and that about sums it up. This is a weird situation where a weird change seemingly was made in the background as far as I can tell, both Switch to Linux and Tails do not necessarily know when this change occurred or how it occurred as there had been no updates in 2024 that would obviously show the sharing of the file name and image, including the model of the USB stick with Belena. Either way, it's going to be interesting to see how this develops through, but it is disappointing if Belena really did change this up without letting users know. If you want more in-depth coverage, I suggest checking out Switch to Linux's video. I'm going to post a link in the description below. He thoroughly goes through what happened. The Godot engine, a flagship project for the FOSS ecosystem when it comes to gaming, has received some awesome updates and upgrades. I don't necessarily cover these often, but it is really cool to see how this community-driven, new updated cross-platform game engine is getting updated, as it's a great open source model that is accessible to indie developers and educators. So I love to see when it gets updates here. I'm just going to briefly talk about some of them. Jolt Physics has been updated. The extension has been used as a de facto physics engine by many Godot developers since its inception in late 2022. So it made sense to integrate it into the engine directly. Jolt Physics itself is actually a standalone open source physics engine, and its creator helped immensely with the Godot bindings. How cool the extension has been officially ported over to Godot. Embed a game window. Godot runs the game as a separate process from the editor for two reasons. Avoid having to share resources as much as possible. In case of a game crash, keep the editor running to avoid data loss. However, this design choice has also caused issues like embedding the game window into the editor, which is something that users like to use if there's limited screen space, like on single monitor setups or laptops. And thanks to some window management skills, now they can get past the issue. Note that this only works on Linux, Windows, and Android for now. There's also been enhanced interactive in-game editing. Modifying your game from within the editor now while it is running or paused has never been easier. This release lets you click on elements within the scene and move the camera, allowing you to explore your game worlds in new ways. And we can see a bit of a demo right here as they are moving stuff around themselves using this improved interactive in-game editing. We've also seen some updates to the core, including optimizations, improvements to the editor, like universal UID support, 3D object snapping, and many, many more improvements. This truly is a testament to FOSS, as Godot Engine is free and open source software released under the permissive MIT license. So you're free to use Godot Engine for any purpose. You can study how Godot Engine works and even change it yourself, and you can distribute an unmodified and changed versions of Godot even commercially under a different license, including proprietary. That with Linux support is a fantastic game engine and I love to see updates. And finally, a massive announcement by AMD introducing Instella, a new state-of-the-art fully open 3 billion parameter language model, which is awesome as AMD has seemingly been winning in open source for a while now. And also with some of the latest graphics cards being released, I'm glad they're finally catching up to NVIDIA and actually superseding them at this point. But regardless of that, what is this new announcement of Instella? Well, it's a new family of fully open 3 billion parameter language models trained from scratch using 128 Instinct MI300X GPUs. These models not only outperform other fully open sourced models of similar size, but also compete favorably with the state-of-the-art open weight models. And that's all fantastic, and we can take it with a grain of salt, 
on how well it actually performs, but that's not the important part here. What the important part here is, if you take away anything, is that it is a fully open and accessible, fully open source release of model weights, training hyperparameters, the data sets, and the code, fostering initiative and collaboration within AI community. That's right. They are releasing not only the models, but everything contributed to making those models under an open license, making them accessible for everyone to research and develop on top of, which is fantastic. This is great for FOSS. As we get a full open source release with AMD, we're getting every component of Instella. This type of transparency and contribution to open source allows researchers and developers alike to experiment, improve, and innovate, which in hope will accelerate AI research in open source so we can continue to build some of the most high performance models and even use them on local hardware, including on Linux. It's pretty wonderful to see as AMD has really been winning the war against Nvidia, at least as of late, when it comes to open source. Not only are they winning on the hardware side of things, at least at the moment, but this commitment to open source has been refreshing to see as N Nvidia has notoriously stayed proprietary for years and years, only as of late receiving access to their proprietary code for NVIDIA GPUs. Anyways, this goes well in depth on how the pre-training results, tuning and alignment work. But what I'm gonna read is just a summary here. The release of Instella family models represents a significant stride in advancing open source AI and demonstrating the capabilities of AMD hardware in large language model training. The three billion parameter models from Instella family significantly outperform present fully opened comparable size models and key benchmarks while also being competitive to comparable open weight models, which we attribute to a high quality data mix selection, multi-stage training pipeline, and the use of high performance Instinct MI 300X GPUs for large scale training. By fully open sourcing the Instella models, including weights, training configurations, data sets, and code, we aim to foster innovation and collaboration within the AI community. And I'd say open source as well. We believe that transparency, reproducibility, and accessibility are key drivers of progress in AI research and development. We invite developers, researchers, and AI enthusiasts to explore Instella, contribute to its ongoing improvement, and join us in pushing the boundaries of what is possible with language models. We will continue enhancing the models across multiple dimensions, including context growth, reasoning ability, and multimodal capabilities. Additionally, we scale up both the model and data set while exploring diverse architectural approaches, keeping your eyes peeled for more exciting blogs on Instella LM's family, its features, and capabilities. I'm definitely excited to keep following this around, and I want to know what you think about this move from AMD. Also, what do you think about the AMD versus NVIDIA GPUs on Linux specifically, especially when you compare the new RTX 50 series versus the RX 9000 series, as AMD's RX 9000 series seemingly offers compelling value in the mid-range, especially when it comes to delivering price to performance ratio. Well, you made it to the end of the video, you're a true fan. Think about subscribing below and don't forget to smash that like button for me. It really does help me out. Catch me in a great community on Discord and I'll catch you in another video. Thanks for watching. Linux can be hard to understand, but I take the most commonly used terms, commands, and subjects in Linux and I break them down into simple to read documents, including Linux terms, flashcards, a checklist, a cheat sheet, and a mind map. And if you're ready to level up your Linux experience and knowledge, go to SavvyNick.com now and get access to these sheets.